Okay, well, welcome everyone to the webinar today. We are going to be talking about the secrets of underwriting. Um, this is a topic that was actually suggested by someone who um, came to our last webinar. So it's something that we're really excited um, to dive into um, and really grateful for everyone that has been suggesting topics along the way. I know um, we're finding a lot of value out of these webinars and many people have been interested in the content. And so uh, if you guys have any um, other suggestions for uh, topics that we should be covering, we'll make sure to touch base with you guys at the end um, of today's webinar as well as in our follow-up email. But for today, again, thank you guys so much for joining us. Um, Mark Gordon, he is our National Director of Sales. He is going to be leading us through um, today's webinar. We do want to make this as interactive as possible. So you'll notice right now you might be an attendee to the webinar. I'm going to promote you to a panelist, which will then allow you to turn on your video. Um, it'll also allow you to unmute yourself and ask questions. If you want, you can also throw in questions in the chat box and I'll make sure to be monitoring the chat box and throw them out to Mark um, just so that we can make sure to get all of your questions answered. So um, let's go ahead and we will get it started. So I'm gonna hand it over to Mark and we are gonna get going with today's webinar. So thank you guys so much for joining us and I hope you find today's content valuable. Awesome. Thanks so much, Courtney, for the handoff. Thank you guys for coming. Um, we are going to do the impossible today. We are going to make underwriting fun and interesting. Um, so give me one second while I pull you guys all back over and I can see everybody. That way we can uh, just like to make sure I can visualize everybody. If you guys can turn your cameras on, that's awesome. If not, I understand, um, you know, some of us still rocking our uh, coronavirus looks. And so uh, it's always Always hard to do that, but if you can turn it on and participate and ask questions, that'd be great. Feel free to interrupt me with questions if you want to or do the chat box. Um, this is all much more interesting for me if I hear from you guys. And yes, please, at the end, if you have anything else you ever want to know about the mortgage industry um, or some of our sales strategies, I'd be happy to do webinars on those moving forward. But thanks for coming. So you guys can all see my screen, right? Cool. All right, Secrets of Mortgage Underwriting. So, and we came with that title specifically to try to make this sound cooler than it is, but we're gonna give you guys a bunch of valuable information. Um, so what we're gonna to cover today is just what is mortgage underwriting? What does a mortgage underwriter do? Um, what does an underwriter evaluate? What is the mortgage underwriting process? And then really tips for you guys and for the customers to give the best possible underwriting and mortgage experience. There are some really just obvious things that you can do going into this process that can make for a smoother and easier um, overall mortgage experience. So we'll, we'll talk about what those things are. So first, underwriting is pretty much the, the process of determining the risk of doing a loan and ensuring that the borrower should be able, we have the expectation this borrower should be able to repay that loan. So in underwriting, we're gonna obviously look at credit, but then also income, assets, the debt that somebody has, which is also part of that credit, um, and then the individual property. And that, so the value of that property, um, what that is in relation to how much of a down payment you're gonna do, is it a condo, is it a multifamily, are you using it as a primary residence or a secondary home or an investment property? All of underwriting is gonna look at, at those factors. So it really comes down to your income, your assets, the equity in the home and the home itself, and then your credit profile for what we're gonna look at from underwriting. So, Underwriters use specific guidelines from programs to check the levels of risk in a borrower's mortgage loan. So here's where I'm gonna to get to the fun part where I kind of explain basically, in 99% of mortgage, the mortgage process today, there is not an individual Does anybody know how to work the audio on this? I can't get any sound. Oh, well, we hear you. Um, I don't, uh, if you go to, uh, real quickly, if you go to the bottom, um, left portion of your screen and you click on where the video camera is and the microphone, usually you can pick what your source is for where that sound comes out of. It might help you out. Um, but so with, 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 there's not an underwriter that's making a, you know, a decision based on someone's overall unique situation in almost all cases. Everybody is underwriting for the most part to the same government guidelines. And that is so that we can provide liquidity on the secondary market. And what I mean by that is if every mortgage company had their own guidelines or each underwriter had their own guidelines, it would be almost impossible to know how much the, the, that mortgage is worth 
or what the risk on that mortgage is unless you had an individual person diving into it every time that loan got sold to a new investor. What we, what we have here is we have these universal underwriting guidelines and they're by Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, FHA, VA, USDA. And so that way, when we have a thousand loans in one category, we know how to evaluate those loans as a group based on risk factors that, because we know that they all follow generally the same guidelines and then we can create liquidity in that secondary market. So really what the job of an underwriter is in the mortgage industry in 2020 is find a way to make your very unique situation because everybody's profile is incredibly different and unique and make it fit into this box so that we can put it into that pool of a thousand loans and get it sold in a group just like all the rest of them. And so that is the job of an underwriter is to check all the boxes to make sure that we fit inside the Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, FHA, VA, USDA box. Uh, very, very rarely are they making their own qualified unique decisions. Although some companies do have their own overlays on top of the guidelines from those other companies, uh, from those other government organizations, that is kind of our baseline. They're setting the tone for that. Um, and if you guys are just getting here and you, and you want to turn your cameras on and hang out, that would be awesome. Love seeing people's faces and reactions and you guys can shout out any questions. I'm seeing a bunch of new people hopping in. So Awesome. So that's kind of basically what, what underwriting is and what we're trying to do is we're trying to fit each loan and its individual scenario into our credit box. We have two ways of doing this. We have automated underwriting, which most of the industry is using um, on almost every single deal. And we have manual underwriting. So very simply, automated underwriting is taking the basic information that you, that's been provided to us by the borrower or the client, running it through an algorithm or our system and seeing either you're approved or you're not approved. And they're, they're looking at some very specific things in that. Um, but that's where it comes down to filling out our uniform residential mortgage application or what we call a 1003. So everybody who's submitting a mortgage application at every company is filling out the same uniform mortgage application. That's why if you go to even our website at Princeton Mortgage, you as a borrower can fill out those exact same questions. We can import that into our 1003 and then automatically putting it through our automated underwriting system all of that is mapped out to make that supposedly very simple and easy. What the underwriter's job then becomes, assuming you get approved by the automated underwriting system, is to do everything you do to verify that all the information that you put in is correct. So that initial automated underwriting approval is based on information provided by the client. And then the underwriter's job is to make sure that all of that information is correct by getting paperwork and documentation during the underwriting process. Everybody with me so far? Make sense? Okay. In some unique situations where maybe somebody doesn't have any credit right now, like traditional credit score, they haven't had any other accounts, or there's some other uh, derogatory things with their credit report that make it so they're ineligible for our automated underwriting process, we do have a manual underwriting process. It obviously takes longer to do um, and can, can really, those loans can come down to underwriter discretion. But at the end of the day, even with a manual underwrite, what we're trying to do is make sure that we can fit this loan into that box so that we can get it as part of those pools of securities and that no one will come back to us and yell at us if this loan doesn't perform. That's really what mortgage companies are trying to do with underwriting is to say, if for some reason the person who gets this loan defaults, no one's gonna be able to come back to us and say it was our fault. That's the, that's the world that we live in. So that's what we're trying to do. We have those two ways of doing it. Again, if you have any questions, type them in, shout them out. So talk about automated on computer generated process, using the information the borrowers provide is our automated underwriting system. And then what the underwriter is doing is gonna review documentation to ensure that things like the income you said you make, the assets you said you have, um, the credit derogatories that you needed to explain, that all those things make sense and line up so that, um, that we know that you actually do qualify for those, those government back guidelines that we talked about. Same thing on the manual side. So underwriters have three choices when they get your loan application. They can approve your loan, and it's usually with an approval we call with conditions, the term you guys might've heard. So that approval with conditions comes out, it basically says your loan is approved based on the information I have here. Here's the additional information I need from you to prove that X, Y, and Z is true. So in other words, it might be, hey, your loan is approved with conditions. Please, please verify that the assets you have in your account, I see this one large deposit for $10,000. Tell us where that came from because we have to make sure you didn't borrow that money from somebody else. 
right? And again, I know we're getting a little bit into the weeds, but the reason we would do that is if you did borrow that money from somebody else, we need to know how you plan to repay that money, right? So that we can factor that into your debt to income ratio, right? So all of the, this is where the mortgage underwriting process gets very complicated or tied in because each individual piece of the information we're reviewing can affect the other pieces of the loan, right? For instance, if you're doing a cash out refinance, what are you doing with that cash out? Are you paying off debt? Well, if we can pay off debt, that might lower your debt to income ratio because you no longer have to make those other monthly payments, even though your mortgage payment might be slightly higher. Does that make your loan more or less risky? And so those are the decisions that we're weighing out and how these things are often tied together. Um, and I'd love for you guys to think about an individual underwriting situation where you had one thing that started to affect a bunch of other things and things became more complicated and we can kind of walk through what might have happened on, on one of your individual, for one of your individual clients as a realtor and kind of talk about that process. So the best case scenario when we submit a loan underwriting is it gets approved with conditions. These are these conditions are things you have to do to get the loan across the finish line. An underwriter can also suspend the loan. And basically what that means is, hey, I have some real questions here about X, Y, or Z. If you can overcome these questions, I'll still consider this loan, but for right now, we're not moving forward. We're gonna pause everything here until we get some clarification on this stuff. So again, for instance, if somebody's looking to buy a house as a primary residence, but the appraiser notes in their appraisal that there's a tenant living in the property right now, that's a non-owner occupied home, we have to, to verify that that person is gonna be moving out so the other person can take over this house as their primary residence. That would be something that we would suspend the loan for because basically if, if we don't get that information, the loan is dead right here, and certainly dead as a primary residence purchase, right? So like there's a big enough issue here where something doesn't make sense. If we can't rectify it, we're done, but I'll give you a chance to rectify it. The third option from an underwriter is to deny the file outright, which basically says, hey, there's a bunch of stuff here. It's unlikely that any of that is going to be overcome here quickly, whether it's, you know, hey, we found multiple bankruptcies in their past and we haven't, you know, we can't, we don't allow for that. Or um, we did a, a search beyond the credit report and we found another mortgage that was in foreclosure recently that we didn't know about. It wasn't showing up on the credit report for some reason. Those things would lead to an underwriter just denying the file when they get, when they get everything in front of them. Questions about hey, the difference between, yeah. We did have a question that came in. Um, so why do some commitments have a list on them? They make me feel like the underwriter is not interested in doing the loan. So I would actually argue the other way, right? And so, and, and so I appreciate this question. By the way, those lists, depending on how they're written, can make you feel very different, right? If somebody writes a list that's consolidated and, and in English, as I like to say, um, you know, where you can read it and it makes sense to you, it can be really helpful to be like, hey, here are the four things we need to get your loan across the finish line. Oftentimes on a commitment, what happens is you're getting the automated underwriting commitment and there'll be a list of 13 things on there, nine of which have to be done internally inside the mortgage company and have nothing to do with your client. And then that can be very overwhelming because you see a list of 13 things and it seems like you have to do 13 things, but really your client only needs to do three or four things or maybe even less that actually have to do with them. So... It depends on how your mortgage company is. Some sort of a list is almost necessary because we want to let everybody know the things that need to happen in order to get the loan across the finish line. And we wanna be very clear that that commitment or that approval is conditional. It's conditional upon meeting those 13 things on the list. The more information, the more detail you have in that list, to me, that's the better job the underwriter did. So. If an underwriter is giving you solutions or giving you ways in order to show proof to overcome those conditions, that's actually better than just saying, hey, we need this, we need this, we need this, and not explaining why or how somebody should go about getting it. So um, the more detailed your commitment is, actually, usually it's the better job the underwriter did, um, as long as those things, those conditions are coming across in a way where everybody understands who is, who is responsible for curing that condition and what and can figure out what we need to do in order to make that happen so i hope that answers the question did it was there any follow-ups on that no follow-ups well keep coming questions are my favorite all right so um so the loan underwriter is going to decide whether or not the borrower can qualify for the mortgage but again they are not um 
they are not making these decisions based on their feelings or they shouldn't be, right? This is very simply, what do I need to see for this borrower's unique situation to make sure they fit inside the box? So let me give you another example, right? The traditional guidelines say that basically in order for us to use overtime income for a borrower, somebody would need to be receiving that income consistently for the last two years, right? So we would need to, or for instance, in order to use a bonus that someone's supposed to get at work, we'd have documented that they've been getting it for the last two years and that they're likely to get it again, right? If we're using that for qualification purposes. So in a scenario where the income was one thing two years ago, was less last year, and now they're in a business that was impacted by the coronavirus, it becomes almost impossible as an underwriter for you to assume that someone's going to get that same bonus or a similar bonus this year. And so this is where it becomes very nuanced in terms of what can we do to ensure that as a company, we, we are doing our due diligence to make sure that if we're gonna use that bonus income to get somebody qualified, they need that or they don't qualify for the loan, how can we get ourselves to a comfortable place where we feel like that bonus is likely to continue? Knowing by the way, that if we do this loan, and the person doesn't get the bonus, and then they default on their mortgage, then we're gonna to have to buy that loan back. And the other thing you have to keep in mind is that a company like ours, which is even very well capitalized for, for a mortgage company, can only handle you know, a few buybacks without it doing real damage to the overall company's health, economic health, because these loans are huge, right? It's a big investment. So there's, there's a fear response to this, which is if we cannot verify that we, or do our due diligence where we feel like we, we are comfortable about the box we're putting this person in, then that, that's gonna, that can come back to bite us in a big way down the road. And that individual underwriter is going to have their decision attached to that loan forever. So that's, that's the decision they're making at that point, which is, hey, I got to make sure we get this right. You have to, and it's a, it's a tough job. It's what Underwriters are some of the highest paid people in the mortgage industry because their decisions ultimately can sink a company if they get it wrong. So just want to share that with you guys. And then I'll, I promise I'll teach you at the end how to work through all of this in a way that um, makes life easier and not so scary. So ultimately, the underwriter will ensure the borrower doesn't close on a mortgage they can't afford, right? And we're using affordability guidelines from uh, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, FHA, VA, following their guidelines. Most of the time directly, occasionally we'll have our own overlays on top of those. And then they want to see if loaning that money is risky or not. So here's the deal. Loaning money is always risky to somebody for 30 years, right? It's almost impossible to know what's going to happen to somebody over the next 30 years. Think about where you were 30 years ago. Think about where you were 10 years ago. Things change, life changes, right? But in the moment, we want to do the best job we possibly can without being overly restrictive. And we want to reduce risk, right? We want our loans to be less risky than the general loans or, or the risk be a tolerable based on what we know about somebody. So again, our, our risk factors are what? Credit score is a part of it. Debt to income ratio versus the amount of income you have coming in and your job stability versus the amount of monthly payments you have going out. The assets you have in the bank, do you have a rainy day fund? If there's an emergency, are you gonna be behind on your bills or do you have something behind that? Um, and then the equity in your home. This is actually maybe the most important one overall. People, if you have 30%, if you're putting 30% down, you're generally not going to get foreclosed on because if things go bad, you can just sell the house. If you put 3% down and things go bad, it's usually, usually not something that you can sell to get out of. You might have to walk away or, or get, end up getting foreclosed on. And that's why the risk attached to pricing and everything else is so loan to value based. Okay. Hey, Mark, question we had another mind. question come in nice. um, and it says, so are you saying that a bigger bank will take more risk but a smaller company is afraid that the risk will put them out of business? So I'm not saying that. And there's a couple factors in, in thinking this through, right? So there is a cost benefit analysis being done by everybody in business all the time and mortgage companies are no different. In order for a smaller mortgage company to compete, the answer might be that we have to be more creative and take on a little bit more risk in order for us to continue to grow our brand or to grow as a company or we're going to have to have some competitive advantage over our bigger people in the industry in order to keep going forward. Each company has got to assess their risk tolerance in their own way. I will say this, when things are going good traditionally in business and the mortgage industry is no different, we tend to assume they're going to go good forever. 
And so we tend to have a higher and higher tolerance for risk. And then about every 10 years, something happens that flips the world on its head. And the people that took on too much risk get buried. So we had 9-11, things were going great. Also, we had 9-11 came out of nowhere, tanked the economy. Then we had the great recession in 2008. Everything was going great, tanked the economy. Now we've been going great for the last 11 years. All of a sudden, coronavirus comes out of nowhere and blindsides us. The people, so we don't know what the next thing that's going to happen is, but we do know historically about every 10 years, something's going to flip this thing on its head. And so the companies that are weighing that risk the best are the ones that will in general survive. But Countrywide going into 2008 was the biggest mortgage company in the history of the world. And basically overnight, they went from the biggest guy on the block to out of business, right? So we saw Washington Mutual get put out of business, but basically had to be acquired because of their mortgage portfolio. Bank of America swallowed up Countrywide in that move. Somebody had to take that down. They basically got blackmailed into it at the table in the 11th hour during the, the height of the financial crisis. And they got fined billions and billions of dollars over the next three years for the previous sins of Countrywide. So I say this only because being bigger doesn't necessarily change your risk level um, in any way, shape or form. It actually, in some ways, you know, one of the nice things about being a smaller mortgage company is if we make a mistake, the CFPB and the government are not going to try to put us out of business for one mistake. But if you're a huge company and they think that you're supposed to be above making those types of mistakes and you have a mistake that's systemic and you do it over 30,000 people, you can get hit with a $30 billion fine one day. We're not going to get hit that way. So there are certain different things that, that change your risk tolerance in different ways. The answer is every mortgage company wants to be awesome at underwriting and wants to never make a mistake, but it's a complicated process and some of it does come down to judgment at the end of the day. And so um, we're all weighing that risk every day. But I know I don't think, I think generally FDIC insured banks right now tend to be tighter in their guidelines, not looser, um, but it also is product specific. Right? So I know that there are some companies on jumbo loans where if you have a ton of money in the bank with them, they'll overlook a bunch of stuff because again, it's about risk, right? So if I'm doing a million dollar loan with PNC, but I have $3 million in my investment account with PNC, that makes me a less, less risk, right? Just in terms of my, 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 if I'm going to default on that or not. So we have to keep those things in mind that at some times, especially outside of Fannie, Freddie, FHA, and VA products, um, the risk is going to be measured individually. So it's, it's product specific. We've had a couple more questions come in too. Awesome. Um, the first one, I always hear a lender say the loan is in underwriting. Does the loan go through underwriting multiple times or does it only go through underwriting once? And from what period to what period is the loan in underwriting? Great question. So almost all loans will go through underwriting at least twice. Um, and probably the industry average is probably somewhere between two and three times. Um, and I'll, let me explain what that means. And usually when we say in underwriting, it's a phase of the mortgage process that basically your loan is in between when it initially gets submitted to underwriting and when your loan is what we call cleared to close. Okay. So what happens up front is we gather all of your initial documentation. We get an appraisal if we need one. We get your title stuff in. We put all that stuff together that's supposed to verify the information you submitted on your mortgage application. And then hopefully when we have it all in one place and together and tight and perfect, we submit it into underwriting. The underwriter reviews all of that stuff. And if everything goes well, your loan is approved with conditions. Now the actual process of underwriting your loan is probably a two or three hour process, right? The actual process of doing it. But you have the wait time of getting into underwriting, which at some companies right now is three or four weeks. Um, here at, at Princeton, I think we're about running about three days um, in order to get your loan into underwriting. And then that, that loan is underwritten and, it's called, and usually it's approved with conditions. That loan then gets kicked back to your loan officer and your processor. Their job is to satisfy those two, three, four conditions, right? In order to get the loan across the finish line. We then resubmit the loan to underwriting and hopefully it comes back for a clear to close. That's like your hopeful process, right? And then once every blue moon, maybe the processor gets everything right on the first try and it goes instantly clear to close, but that's not traditionally how it works. So that's kind of the, the process of underwriting is it goes from underwriting back to processing. Processing cures all of those conditions, sends it back. Underwriting says, okay, we're good. Or maybe, maybe there's a second time of an underwriting they go, hey, thank you for submitting this new information. Here's one new piece. Of, so thank you for getting this updated bank statement. 
this bank statement now has a new deposit we need to get sourced. So I'm kicking it back to you one more time to get this one last piece of documentation. Processor gets that, they put that loan back in again to underwriting and now we're clear to close. So that process of that loan getting passed back and forth while it's in underwriting can be passed pass back and forth between the processor and the underwriter several times, depending on the complications of the law. What, was it, what other questions did we get, Courtney? Um, so there, this is submitted from one person and there are a couple questions in here. So um, number one, are you able to do FHA now with COVID? And if so, how many stubs are needed after unemployment due to COVID? Um, how much movement in account do you recommend when applying for a mortgage? I generally okay, tell you. So okay. Let me, let me do the first things first. <laughs> yes, we can do FHA. Um, and we're, we're planning to have some new things in place, hopefully in the next week or so, that'll make it even easier to do FHA, removing some of the obstacles that were in place for us. But we are doing FHA. I will admit that it's harder than it's exceedingly hard right now to get an FHA loan, but I'm hoping in the next couple of days to have that rectified here at Princeton. And there certainly are companies out there that are still doing FHA and VA loans. Um, I, in some of my previous webinars, if you go back and watch even from the first one four weeks ago, you can go in and really, um, I, I talk a lot about why that is. Um, and then, so what was the second part of that question? Um, if so, how many stubs are needed after unemployed due to COVID? So right now, we're looking for 30 days back at work. So two consecutive pay stubs in 30 days is what we're looking for, but we're still feeling our way through that as well as, as an agent. When I say we, I don't mean Princeton Mortgage. I mean, the industry is still waiting for guidance on this, but traditionally, as long as you've had less of than six months of a gap at work, so whether you were out on for disability or whatever, as long as you have less than six months out, you only need 30 days back on in order to close. And it doesn't mean you need 30 days back on, by the way, to apply. We can start your mortgage process for you and then just close on your loan after 30 days and two pay stubs. And then what was the third part of that question? How much movement in account do you recommend when applying for a mortgage? I generally tell clients if money is in bank, don't touch except for regular bills like utilities, insurance, and don't take out new credit. Um, and then it, uh, Follow-up question to that is, what is the highest DTI you will allow and still approve? Okay, so um, yes, the short answer is, we are gonna look at 60 days worth of bank statements to verify assets that some, for a purchase loan that someone needs to bring to closing. So if somebody applies today and they're closing on June 15th, we're probably gonna look at everything that happened from today back 60 days, and then we're also going to check what happened over the, the rest of this time period. Applying for new credit is a problem because it can it take your credit score or if you get approved for that other credit, we may have to factor that credit and the payments on that credit into your debt to income ratio, which can change your qualification level or whether you qualify at all. Um, and our max debt to income ratio back end is 57 for FHA, 50 for conventional, um, and on VA loans, there really is no specific number. Um, I've seen really, really high DTIs go through for VA loan, um, but it, it, it depends on their automated underwriting system. Um, but certainly I've seen them go through higher than 57. Um, so just uh, that, answers, that answers that part of the question, I think, but if not, feel free to keep firing at me. And then I think one more. If a client uses a credit restoration company to improve credit, how do they keep that from hurting? And multiple clients have told me that no mortgage, that n multiple clients have told me that no mortgage because they successfully used a restoration company. So there are some mortgage companies that do not allow credit repair or, um, you know, basically getting your credit score up during the mortgage process. Currently right now, Princeton Mortgage is nothing like that in terms of our overlays. In fact, oftentimes for our customers, after they've applied to us, we will do a calculation or run a simulator to see what that person would need to do to get their credit score up. And we'll actually uh, tell them exactly how to do it. And then if they get their score up, we will use that new score. Um, so for us, um, if you have the means, in other words, Sometimes getting your credit score up can be as simple as, 
paying down a credit card balance $300 and it can make your score go up 30 points. I don't think you, I don't think that doesn't strike me as manipulation as a lender. To me, that's like, Hey, who would know that? And, uh, and by the way, this is, you know, I don't want to be penalized 30 basis points because I had $10,000 in my checking account and I didn't realize that this, this balance was hurting me in that sort of a way. So, um, for us as a company, you know, we, we almost do the credit repair for some of this stuff in house in terms of getting people better qualified. But I have definitely heard of other mortgage companies that if they, they only really not do that internally, but externally, they're not, they're not looking to work with those clients. Again, we feel, we feel differently about it, but it's very lender specific and there's certainly nothing in the Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac guidelines that prohibits you from fixing your credit before you apply for a loan or even while you're applying for a loan. Cool. Any other that's, questions? That's all the questions that we have right now. Cool. We'll keep firing away. I love this stuff. So um, this is what an underwriter does. An underwriter is going through and making sure that, that your loan fits into that box. So we talked about our three C's. Credit, capacity, which in other words, in other words, for debt to income ratio, are you, do you have the ability to repay? And then the collateral of the house, which we talked about is how much money you're putting down. So one of the things you've seen mortgage companies, including Princeton, really crack down on during the coronavirus is what we call is where people don't have any skin in the game. So if, people, if you're doing an FHA loan right now, where you're putting three and a half percent down, but you're getting that three and a half percent as a gift from somebody. And then you're also getting a 6% seller's concession to cover the cost of that loan, which is what a lot of these loans were doing. Well, if things go bad for you, you have no skin in the game. You're essentially renting that property at that point if you just got into that loan because you didn't have to come out of pocket for any of the money on either side. That is exceedingly more risky as a lender in terms of statistically than even just have somebody having a low credit score. So a low credit score, there's a lot, of, a lot of factors that can happen with a low credit score, but not putting any of your own skin in the game on your real estate transaction very specifically makes you more likely to default. So some of the things I think you're going to see mortgage companies do to protect themselves as we get to back to our new normal is say like, hey, if you can put 5% down of your own money, we might overlook a higher debt to income ratio or a lower credit score but we want to make sure that you're just as invested in making sure this works out as we are. And, and invest, when I say invested, I mean in terms of the money coming out of your own pocket. So you may see some, some individual lender overlays that challenge previous conceptions of what makes somebody credit worthy as we come through this because people are going to be looking for job stability and they're going to be looking for um, having that skin in the game or having assets in the bank and ability to repay. Um, questions about any of that? And even if you didn't type them, feel free to shout them out. Unmute, yell at me. All right. Awesome. So credit. Borrower's credit score evaluates are responsible when they pay back their debt. How many, I don't know if you have any guys know this, but credit scores basically go from 350 to 850. The national average right now is in the low 700s and it moves, you know, in that range. Um, for lending purposes, anything over 740 is generally considered perfect. Anything under 620 is generally considered really bad. Um, and then each 20 credit score points in between can have huge differences in terms of the pricing of your loan, whether or not you qualify, um, and, and, you're, and whether or not you're eligible for certain products. So 620 and 640 are looked at very differently. 640 and 660 are looked at very differently. Even 700 to 720 can be looked at very differently in terms of eligibility, product, and pricing. And even our automated underwriting system, they look at not only what the credit score is, but the individual debts and how you got there. So two credit scores of 660 may be looked at differently if one is 660 because there was mortgage late last year versus one is 660 because of a couple of medical collections. The, the under, automated underwriting system will view the medical collections as something that can happen to, happen to you and doesn't make you necessarily more risky to default versus mortgage rates make you at a much higher risk of default. Okay, and so the, our, even our automated system is designed to look specifically at that. Capacity. So from a debt to income ratio perspective, anything over 43% is considered risky. So let me kind of explain what that means. You have a borrower whose gross income is $120,000 a year or $10,000 a month. If the total monthly bills on their credit report, so their principal and interest mortgage payment, their homeowner's insurance, their property taxes, student loans, credit cards, auto payments, installment loans of any sort. If the total amount of those monthly payments is more than $4,300, dollars 
then that's considered very risky. Now that may seem conservative, but when you factor in that 30% or more of that $10,000 is going to taxes off the top, and someone's coming home with actually $7,000, and then we have $4,300 in bills on a credit report, which by the way doesn't include food, clothes, cell phones, electric bill, water bill, um, you know, any, any other sort of up cable, you know, any of those other sort of household bills. Um, do people still have cable? Some people still be in the year. Um, any of those other bills, then you see that that's actually pretty lenient. Having said that, like I said before, we do have products in the industry here and at many other companies that go as high as 57% on that back end debt to income ratio. So in, in my opinion, we are still more flexible as an industry and as income ratio than sometimes makes sense to me as I actually look at the individual loans. Oftentimes, if I'm, if I'm telling somebody that it's a good idea to buy something where their debt to income ratio is that high, it's because I know that there's a co-borrower that for some reason isn't on the application that also contributes income or some other form of income that they're not using to qualify. Um, otherwise, if you're really at 57%, your likelihood of default is really high, unless you have a ton of money in the bank because uh, you know, there's just no room, there's no flexibility. When you're factoring in the taxes you already pay, the other bills you have, it's very hard to, to figure out how to make that work, realistically. Any questions about any of that? Okay. I, I have a question on that. Sure. Um, debts that are about to be retired, say somebody has a credit card with, you know, or, or some kind of a loan, a, say a car loan that only has 12 months left on it. Is that treated any differently from the underwriting debt point of view? Great question. So um, the answer in short is yes, but it wouldn't be for a credit card because right, a credit card, we could always run the balance up again and we don't know how that, how that, but, right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and in, but like if you have a car loan that has less than 10 payments left, we can usually exclude that from your debt to income ratio and not count it at all. Um, and so that's definitely a factor, but for a lease, for instance, we wouldn't be able to exclude it because when you have a lease, we assume that when that lease is up, you're going to get another one, right? Or you're going to have to buy out another car in some other way. But if you have a car loan that is less than 10 payments left, we can assume that you will not renew that. And that will, that will, that will be excluded from your debt to income ratio picture. So installment loans, like if you were to get a loan through like Prosper or one of these other, you know, uh, companies that's always mailing out for, for, uh, installment loans or anything like that, if it's less than 10 payments between, um, now, between now and when that's going to be paid off, you should be able to exclude it in most cases. Okay. Great okay. question. Um, and then, you know, the last piece of this obviously um, is the collateral itself. And again, second homes are viewed as more risky than primary residences at just a little bit because you, the theory is you pay your bills first on the primary residence before you went on your vacation home. Investment properties are considered exceptionally more risky. And the reason is one is obviously if it's an investment and that investment goes bad, people tend to be willing to let those things go into foreclosure or stop making payments. Additionally, oftentimes we're assuming that your renter is going to keep paying the rent in order for you to keep paying the mortgage on your installment loan. And we're not evaluating the credit worthiness of your renter. So if your renter stops paying rent and then you stop paying your mortgage, that's a much riskier loan. And that's why in, in, in storm, I mean, investment properties often have much higher rates, are limited in the amount of products and require more money to put down because of the risk associated with them. Um, additionally, some things you might not think about very much or even condos are considered riskier, right? Well, why, is, why are condos considered riskier? Well, because there's individual factors with a condo that can affect value, such as Maybe the HOA itself stops, starts doing a bad job. They don't budget correctly. They get the HOA gets sued. That can make it harder for the bank to foreclose or to get their money back in the event of a foreclosure. Um, the value of an entire condo complex can go down for some other reason, and so that can push values down and the amount of comps are around. And also, when you have an entire building that's, that's owned by one entity, if that let's say the HOA goes out of business or they can't afford to make repairs to the building. The individual borrower or the bank, in this case, if we have to foreclose, can't change those things. So they're considered riskier loans, which is that way, even on a condo, you have different pricing than a regular home when, when it's over set, when the loan is over 75% loan to value. Um, so just some little things that, that you might not think about in terms of um, impacting risk of loans. Um, Mark, we did have one question that came in about school loans. 
So, so how are those kind of con considered from an underwriting perspective? So assuming that you're already making payments on them, then we just factor those payments into your debt to income ratio. If the loans are currently deferred, depending on the loan products, we're going to kind of make up what we think the payments will be or find out from the student loan company what the payments will be when those loans are no longer in deferment. And one thing to factor in is even if you know, for instance, that they're going to be deferred for the next four years, let's say, well, we can't assume that for a number of reasons, the least of which is that we can't make sure that the person that's going to school is going to stay in school and those loans are going to remain deferred. So no matter how long they're supposedly deferred for, we're going to have to factor in some sort of monthly payment into the qualification process um, in that way. And so, so yes, yeah, student loans for the current generation of people graduating and being first at home buyers is a, has a huge impact towards their overall ability to borrow and fund and, and get their loans funded. Um, so I hope that answers that question. So how long does underwriting take? take? Well, the actual process of underwriting alone is, like I said before, is a few hours. Uh, you know, uh, two, to, two to four hours at the very high end um, for a complicated underwrite. So the actual process does not take long. However, most mortgage companies, even at their best, are running at 24 to 48 hour turn times. And as the industry is kind of a little bit overloaded right now, we're seeing turn times as high as three or four weeks. Um, as I said to you guys earlier, on our retail side for things at, at Prince right now, we're, I think we're running 72 hours. Um, in terms of how long the underwriting entire process takes, this is really gonna depend upon two things, three things. One is, how well is the initial package your loan officer put together when they sold the loan? Did they get all the initial documentation from the borrower? Did they get W-2s, pay stubs, and everything else they needed that was correct and accurate? And did they look for things that might be wrong? Did processing do the same thing when they delivered that loan to underwriting? And then how fast is the processor able to gather those extra conditions once we do that initial underwrite up front? before they get the loan back into underwriting for the second time. Um, a well-oiled machine on the mortgage side where a loan officer does a good job, you could get loans clear to close in as quick as two to three weeks. Um, when things are busy, it could take as long as two to three months. And so there are a lot, this is, this process is gonna come down to a lot. This is the biggest thing that's, on, that's the differentiator between companies and individual loan officers. A very good loan officer at a very good company can save you months of stress and anxiety on your mortgage process. Um, rates are gonna be usually similar company to company, uh, although they can make a difference, especially on larger loans. But the experience of the underwriting process will be very different based on the experience and qualifications of your loan officer and the company that you're working with and how well their machine is working. Um, any questions about underwriting and the, the timeline? All right. So here's what we wanna make sure that we're not doing, right? We don't wanna apply for any new credit lines or increase spending during the underwriting process. But more importantly, and here, here's the thing I really recommend more than anything. The minute someone starts thinking they might buy a house, they should apply. Um, and I know that may sound counterintuitive, but when I say apply, they need to get their documentation to a loan officer and in front of an underwriting team up front because there are many different things that we can do to make the underwriting process go more smoothly. For instance, we said we're gonna look at 60 days worth of bank statements, right? Well, if we know more than 60 days out from when we're actually gonna put an offer in, what the loan process is gonna look like and what we need, there are things that we can do to make our underwriting process much more simple, right? We can just not have a bunch of transactions going in and out of our accounts and, and making sure that we're, you know, that we're explaining in and out of those accounts so that underwriters can see it and understand what's coming in and out. We know that if we can do, that we should be doing credit repair. And sometimes credit repair can be as simple as taking the $300 a month you're putting towards your, this account and moving that towards this account. And that may make your credit score go up. That can make a big difference in terms of the pricing of the program you're able to get two or three months down the road. So getting a good loan officer, all of that information sooner gives us more time to get those things correct and make sure you're getting the best program and the best pricing your customer can possibly get. So time, time, extra time can make a huge difference in the pressure of the process. Um, especially if your loan officer is, is working hard and has the, the customer's best interest in mind. Um, when we need something from your clients and we tell, we try to tell everybody up front, Hey, listen, we're going to make this effortless as possible. The mortgage process isn't fun. If I don't need it, I won't ask you for it. If I do ask you for it, it's because I need it. And you don't have to like me about it, but you got to get it for me as quickly as possible. 
So when we ask for different things from, the, from our borrowers, the, the speed about getting it back to us is gonna make a huge difference in terms of how fast everybody in the mortgage company is gonna jump to get things done. If you're a loan processor, for instance, your goal is to get loans out of your pipeline as quickly as possible because you want to be able to take more loans on and get and, and, and filter through faster. So loans that sit because we're just waiting on somebody getting documentation in are always going to take a back seat to the loans that a processor feels that they can get through the process quickly and get that loan clear to close sooner. So make sure you're getting that stuff in quickly. And then the other thing is borrowers should be as transparent as possible upfront about what's going on in their situation. Underwriting in the mortgage industry is incredibly good at finding the bad stuff. It's almost impossible to get away with something. So if you tell your clients this stuff up front, like, should I tell my mortgage loan officer? The answer is yes. Tell them everything, lay it out on the table up front. There are a hundred really good legitimate ways that we can get around some problems your client may have had in the past if we know about them up front. And we can do it smoothly and quickly and, and make sure we hit all our deadlines and our commitment dates and everything else. If we get surprised and blindsided by those things, first of all, your loan might get turned down because the underwriter might feel like it was intentional and there was fraud involved. But even more so, fixing those problems in process with those deadlines looming is incredibly stressful for everybody, including your loan officer and the team. Having, knowing those things up front makes it very easy to overcome those things. Again, it's the difference between being super stressful and tense versus like, oh, I got this because I had enough time to get it done up front. So just hey, tell your clients, be super upfront. Hey, even if you're like, hey, I'm, I don't think this is a problem, but let me tell you about it. I'd rather know upfront so I know how to navigate it and I can let everybody on my team know than finding out about it, you know, because we stumble into it later. There's, there's, it's very hard to get away with anything in this industry. And I say that to you. So like the risk, the juice is not worth the squeeze. If you, if you think there's a chance we're going to find it, we're going to find it. So let us know up front. Um, we've yeah. had uh, two questions that have come in. First one, the fuzzy variable here is the three amigos, the bureaus. Who's policing or monitoring or governing them for possible abuses and inaccuracies? A great question. Um, so, I mean, the CFPB is the institution that would be in charge of that if, those, if, those, if there's abuse there. Um, I try, I don't want to get super political, but I think, you know, different administrations take the job of the CFPB uh, very differently. And the amount of teeth the CFPB has to institute change or hold people accountable changes dramatically by who's in charge. Um, and so um, right now, uh, it's, it's going to be up to you as an individual to hold those credit bureaus accountable for the information on your individual accounts. There's not a ton of oversight or a ton of pressure from the government on any of our financial institutions, including mortgage companies and everything else. Everybody is kind of flying under the radar right now. There's just not a lot of federal oversight um, in, in the banking world. Um, so, and by the way, that could change dramatically, you know, in November. So I don't know how to prepare for that, but that's just the reality of what we've seen over the last three and a half years. Um, so, um, it's up to you to point those things out. In general, we find that filing, filing complaints or to come to those companies can be very time consuming and frustrating, but ultimately we do usually get to the right place. Um, but you have to be kind of, pa patience is a virtue is an understatement. And, and for me, that's a very difficult thing to do. I'm not a particularly patient person, but if you're willing to be patient and work with those companies, we have seen them be um, accommodating and getting things rectified most of the time. And then what was the other question, Courtney? Um, how can we as realtors help speed up underwriting? Yeah, again, so the, the best ways, right? Have your clients apply early, right? You know, so, in it, hey, we're just looking for a house. Cool. Well, before we go out and look, let's see what you qualify for. Let's get all the information over to a mortgage person. And by the way, it gives us, I can almost say that unless somebody's already walking into everything with a perfect application. And by the way, that does, I, I would say maybe 40% of the applications we get are like, this is a no brainer. It meets all, it checks all our boxes is easy. For the other 60%, giving me an extra month or two to get things in order is almost always going to result in a better experience and probably better pricing for your client. Because we can do things like, hey, if your credit score goes up 16 points, we can do, we can get better pricing for you. And all you have to do to get that 16 points is, pay $200 to this one card or pay down to this balance. 
Um, so there's a number of things that we can do as a mortgage company if we have time to do it. Um, so, and then transparency about previous situations, right? So, so often I'll have somebody, you know, apply for a loan, they got denied by somebody else, they don't tell us why they got denied, and then it pops up through my process, and now it's like, hey man, if I would have known about that up front, I could have worked around it. Now that I'm finding out about it, at the end of the process, it, your loan blows up. So completely upfront in terms of previous issues, transparency around what's going on, allow, us to, allow your loan officers the opportunity to be experts and work around obstacles, um, and giving us as much time as possible. Um, you know, if, you, if I'm waiting until you're out of attorney review to get your application, and your commitment date is a week or two down the road, you're putting so much pressure on that process that I'm no longer worried about whether or not I'm getting your client the best deal. I'm no longer worried about things I can do to improve the process. It's like a panic of like, whatever I can get, I need to get it as fast as possible. And so speed is now taking precedence over service, over pricing, over all those other things. Um, and so you're putting your, you're putting your client in a bad spot if they're not putting all their ducks in a row prior to submitting an offer. And hopefully prior to even go, going to look. Any other questions? Nope, we're good. All right. So this kind of sums that up. And then I'm good. So questions or comments from you guys or anything else that we can do in terms of uh, did this spur any thoughts on what we can do next time or what you're interested in. But I sincerely appreciate everybody coming and hanging out. And I hope you guys found it valuable. Um, but again, the biggest thing you can do for your borrowers is have them submit applications early and make sure that you're working with a loan officer that has been around the block. Um, you know, experience matters with this stuff. Um, each loan and each individual client are, are so different. It may seem like everybody's the same from a realty perspective, but I can tell you as a loan officer, I still see things every day I've never seen before. You want somebody who knows how to deal with those situations and knows how underwriters are going to look at those situations in order to get that loan into that magic box that we talked about. Any other questions at all? I always feel like I did a bad job if there's no questions at the end. So. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you guys so much again for coming. Please send out any sort of ideas for future ones that we can do. We want these to be valuable. Um, and uh, everybody else stay safe. Courtney, yeah, we, awesome. Thank you, Mark. Um, we will be sending out an email tomorrow just kind of as a follow-up for everyone. So in the email, you will find a copy of the deck that Mark walked through today as well as a recording um, of the webinar. And then we'll also ask you, we have a survey there that we would love for you um, to fill out and respond. Give us feedback. What could we be doing better? And most importantly, what should we be talking about next? So would love for you guys to share comments, thoughts. Um, it, it's really helpful and appreciative for us. And it's been driving the content that we've done the past two weeks. So we really appreciate it. So thank you, everyone. Um, have a wonderful rest of the day. Bye, guys.